Welcome to the Political Ferret Show. New content will be uploaded every Wednesday and Sunday. This video was financed by my Patreons. Thank you for making the change possible. Whenever people try to explain nativism, it either offends the right or the left. The left will point out it is bad because it's xenophobia. And the right on the other hand will offend the left by suggesting that people from different parts of the world are just different. The word itself means that people who occupy a certain room prefer those people who are already there or closer than those who are far away. The opposite is diversity, the idea that every addition will make everything better. To specify nationalism is the idea that people follow a similar set of rules. Nationalism does not care about your skin color origin or such. It cares mainly about your behavior if someone else from far away behaves like someone in the nation has to behave and all others behave, he will be accepted by those already there. Racism on the other hand checks people based on similar body traits. If you look strange, you have a hard time of being accepted. Only the mindset of an ethnostate and in no other model of nationalism, this can combine racism and nationalism with no inconsistency. In other words, most racists are not nationalists and most nationalists are not racists. In regards to nativism, most people use examples of the West, which I will not do. I planned to use India, but instead I will talk about South Africa and the nativism of the African people there, because it is somewhat more pronounced than the nativism of the Indian people. In this presentation I will show what sentiments seemingly, but not de facto, start nativism, ask if it changes society and what happens if nativism succeeds and finally we explore what happens after that. So let's start in prehistorical times, in the time of ethnic homogeneity South Africa was dominated first by the Sun and then by the Khoikho. The group is better known as the Khoisan. Around the time of large migration movements in Europe, this area also saw a large migration movement, mainly by the Bantu people, who moved to the place we know today as South Africa. Since humans are very fond about differences, these groups did not mix so well. Would they have mixed, they would all speak the same language, which they are not. So rivalry, confrontation and if you want to call it xenophobia existed there also back then. Since the 1400s Europeans visited the land. At first the strangers were met with joy because, well, they bought food and paid with exotic goods. A good deal for all. In the 1600s the first settlers came to stay. The idea was to establish a colony that would provide support for the ships, food, water, limited repair facilities and so on. Since the natives were no farmers and had therefore no real concept of land ownership, the land had not to be conquered. You just took the empty land and fenced it. The newcomers thought they would not take something from anyone because nobody laid claim to the land. In the late 1700s the European war arrived in South Africa with the British taking over large parts of the land. In the early 1800s the Zulu tried to expand their influence to the south which brought him in conflict with the native population and later with the British. In about the same time the British abolished all kinds of slavery which brought him into a conflict with the Boer people, colonists largely from Dutch descendants, because a lot of their investment was bound into their slaves. The result was war and with the even more white domination. But let's stop here. What was going on? At first traders came and were welcomed with open arms because they brought stuff. Then the first settlers came and some native became suspicious because these newcomers settled and took land, which was a new concept. Still, most saw it as an opportunity. They brought agriculture and therefore new products. You could trade animal skins for exotic things such as bread or alcohol. But the idea that these people don't belong here started to get a grip. Or better, moths moved from the others in the north to these new pale guys. The others of the north seemed now more like them compared with these whiteies. In the next step the white people brought the conflicts of their homelands to Africa, bringing additional weapons, confrontations, war and fear to the shores. Slavery was also an important issue. From the looks of it the white migrants 
saw the man in slavery but well fed is better off than a guy who starved to dead. So they saw no real problem in that. But from the view of the slave, well, he might see that a little bit different. So nativism seems to arrive with the influence of a group that is perceived as the other and will be projected onto those who are less similar to those people who are already there and accepted. In the times before the white man, the Bantu were the others, then the Zulu were the others and so on and so on. But all that was forgotten as long as there were someone who is way more different, as another culture looks different. The African nativism is strong. The video of President Zuma singing Kill the White Farmers is well known. The idea is Africa to the Africans, an idea that is also well accepted with the Western left. So what happens if nativism is successful? Well, it's civil war. Wherever a colony became free, the next step was civil war because the old borders became invisible. A good example is India. As long as India was under the rule of the British, all of India stood against them. But once they were gone, well, the split into India and Pakistan was inevitable. Does it also result in the betterment for the little guy? Well, not always, often quite the opposite is true. But what is better and worse is in the eye of the beholder. Some would prefer to live in poverty but free. However, nativism is in fact not growing or falling, as long as the group is the same. It is just projecting on other groups over time. The only group that would never undergo a civil war after throwing out the others are those groups who don't throw them out in the first place. The West has, compared to pretty much any other culture, a very low degree of nativism. Not none. But it is lower than the nativism of, let's say, the nativism of the native South Africans. The funny thing is that the same people in the West who condemn European nativism praise African nativism. The important thing is to understand that once a nativistic movement is absolutely successful, it will turn on the next group of others, and then on the next, and then on the next. Unbound and limitless, nativism will try to sterilize anything and make it as pure as water. The problem is that nothing can exist in pure water, uh, but mud is also not the place to be. What you want is a balance. The Western nativism is small compared to any other, and this is one of the pieces of the puzzle that describes Western successfulness. But the idea to follow the promises made by it to the bitter end also ends in purism, in the pursuit to eliminate more and more and more unclean things. Nativism is a stabilizing factor in the world that has to be kept in balance. It is neither good or bad, it is part of our nature and always will be. Nativism is like salt in your food, you need the right dosage. And to figure out how much you need takes time and experimentation, or you ask your elders how they did it in the past, because most of the time what they did will work again.